Come on, it's the one we appeal on the other side. I have to like mash the gas to even get it to idle. So about a week ago, Hoogie and I were driving along and we seen this barn surrounded by old cars. I was driving through Cayuga. This is my regular route that I have to take uh, once a week going to work and I spotted an old car sitting outside. We stopped in, introduced ourselves and uh, said, hey, we love your collection. Do you mind if we take a look? It took me two hours last night of looking through the internet to figure out what this car actually was. And the only reason I was able to finally find it was because the grill on this was completely different than every other one. There are very few survivors because it was pre-war. All of them either got cut up for the war movement or destroyed or scrapped or whatever. About the same time SDP came to us and said, hey, can you make a video on our fuel and oil additives? We put the two together, asked if we could work on any of the cars. And today we're working on a 1939 Hudson. So we're gonna throw a bunch of hard work and some STP at it to try and get this old girl back on the road. Here we go. First off, how do you get this thing open? Hey, that oh. did something. As as cool as that is. It's gonna be hard to work on. Yeah, let's take the hood off. So, so this is the original <laughs> six cylinder flathead. Uh, very easy to work on because all the valve train is underneath. But uh, since this is an old, probably a 30s engine, um, I'm not 100% sure. I know they came with an eight as well, which made them kind of unique. And I know Hudson was one of the first ones to come out with a balanced crankshaft. They used to put lead in the fuel. Lead protected the valve seats and was a very good anti-knock agent. So they had, it actually raised the octane quite a bit. So first things first, we're gonna do a compression test. Pull the spark plugs, take a look at each plug, see what it, what uh, what's wrong with it. We did get it running outside, but it was only running on like four. Like a bag of cats. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't have enough power to come up the hill itself. So no. we got a workout this morning already. One good thing is, it's got new spark plugs in it, so. Yeah, so that, that did not fix the that problem. That did not fix the problem. <laughs> a lot of smoking. I'm wondering if there's oil coming out right out the exhaust. And I wanna scope each cylinder before we pull it. Pull the head off. But yeah, have a look. We'll check our fluids. We checked oil before we started it. The oil was up, we checked the coolant, it's and then uh, it's nice and warm. For that little <laughs> bit that we were running, <laughs> it's warm. Is there so, fluid in it? There's lots of fluid I in it. I guess we should have so. checked that before we started. No, yeah, I'm going over heat and that quick a little bit of no, time. But, um, yeah, let's pull the plugs. So we're going to do a compression test, uh, see how bad shape she's in. Hopefully it's okay. Uh, Rich is just working on disconnecting the coil so we don't freaking arc it out on ourselves. When we're doing a compression test, we want to do it at wide open throttle, um, choke off. Basically, we just want to make sure that we have hopefully over 100 pounds compression in each one. Anything of a variance more than 25% between the cylinders is, a, is kind of a make or break for today. So as long as it's got compression, I think we've got a chance. So here we go. So far, so good. 90. I don't think we have to pull ahead. Usually, if it's a head gasket, it's between cylinders. Yay! So, number one is down 10 psi, but I don't think that's the problem. So, we'll throw the plugs back in again. Can you check the owner's manual, see what the spark plug needs to be gapped at? Yeah. <laughs> If you don't look, it won't rack, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, isn't that satisfying? There's lots of lubrication in this book. <laughs> lubrication, front axle, and spring suspension. So oh. Hudson's were uh, famous for their ride suspension. They had a couple traction bars that kept the uh, front axle stable, and then they were able to use uh, longer leaf springs than most other manufacturers. So these are really nice, comfortable driving cars. Page two, maybe? Selective automatic shift, are you kidding me? Spark plug gap, 25 though. 
and one five three six two four is the firing order. And what's the other thing? Uh, we need the distributor gap twenty thou. I think this is a different car. Yeah. Yeah. Th look. Look at the dash layout. It's a different dash. Right. Right. So online. A... Online. It said what? Thirty two. Thirty two. So just give a little tap -a Tighten it up just a hair. Okay, so we're going to hook the coil back up again, and now we'll check for spark, because it, it sounded like it was running on four cylinders. It should just purr like a kitten. Okay. So we're looking for consistency. All right, grab your heat gun. They'll get warmer as we go to the front because the exhaust is going to the front. Well, we haven't really changed anything, so I really don't expect anything to be different other than maybe a spark plug wasn't plugged in all the way or, or something like that. But. Um, it's definitely running on all six now, just running like a bag. So we'll take the carburetor apart, we'll clean it, um, see what, what's inside that, and we'll uh, empty the fuel tank. There's a lot of oil in the exhaust. You can smell it just burning. But the plugs aren't covered in oil. Like, it's burning okay. It's, it's yeah. like carboned up, but it's not it's, like, yeah, it's it's not, not like it's oil. It's not crazy bad, yeah. No, so, it, like, we got to stop comparing this to, like... What, an LS? Typical... Did you change the diesel injectors first? <laughs> I don't know. Did you turn the little spring thing? We're just going to check fuel flow. We're going to see whether this is a dehydrated rich in Bowling Green, Kentucky, or a well lubricated Stefan at the end of Nashville. So that's, that's plenty to run. So it's not restricted. Ah, keep it going. Is that the trickle? No, no, this is like a halfway in between. It's not like a, a very well lubricated Stefan, but it's not a completely dehydrated, filthy rich either. That's good. Just take a whiff. It doesn't smell that great. Like, no. it's not horrible. It's not horrible. It's not completely Varsali. Let's see if it burns. I'm charged with the task of seeing if this fuel's any good, and I like burning stuff anyway. Don't quote me on that. I'm just going to uh, throw some in this convenient cup, and we're going to burn stuff. All right, looks like a good amount. Well, well of course this doesn't work. There we go. Seems pretty good. You want to tell me what happened here? Uh, dude, it's a fire. I don't know. I came by and was checking out the fire. There's a little bit of sediment in the bottom of the bowl. Uh, nothing to be too, too concerned about. I've seen tractors with a lot more run a lot better. So we'll clean it out and then, uh, um, do you think we should drain the fuel and put new fuel in or just add the additives and clean the carb? Let's throw the additives in because the fuel seems to be pretty potent when it's lit on fire. <laughs> Doesn't smell that bad, no. Let's, uh, let's put the additives in. I've definitely in. smelled worse things in my life. Yeah. Let's, um... Like an armadillo's carcass? Is there a fuel gauge? Yeah, it's empty. I don't know. I don't know how reliable a 1939 fuel gauge is. <laughs> it was new when it was old. put in. <laughs> Right? So maybe it's still perfectly fine. Look at this. Whoa, crazy. So I just bought this cheap scope off of Amazon. The link will be in the description. Mm -hmm. And uh, it works pretty cool. How it, much was it, Stefan? I don't know. It was like 11 Canadian dollars. You can find cheaper ones. This one's way too long than what I need. It seems to work pretty good. I downloaded an app to use it. And we're gonna test it out now on the uh, cylinders. We're gonna take the bore scope, stick it down in before we add any additives, see what kind of carbon buildup we've got on top of the pistons. We'll try and get it running with some better fuel and the additives inside. We will uh, drive it for as much as we can if we can get it running properly down the road. We'll also take some carboned up. We've got some pistons at home. We'll just take them and put them in kind of a concentrated solution of the STP and see if it breaks down the carbon deposits. It might need heat to, to work quicker but um that way we can see whether um the additives are working or not so you got her yeah see if it works oh yeah oh man i can get don't look at don't film that no you need don't uh, i'm looking it's for per self discovery purposes only oh everybody <laughs> it is it's scary you don't want to look at stuff up close like that all right 
<laughs> so that's already the top of the piston. That, that's cleaner than I thought it was. I can zoom in on that. <laughs> yeah, with your... That's kind of cool. But yeah, we can actually, you know, we could just use a light and look down the hole because the piston looks pretty well, good. Well, you know, what, why'd you pick one at top dead center, Rich? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see some cylinder wall. All right, just... let's see some cylinder wall. They're all at top dead center. Are we just looking at valves? Could be. That just looks like a dirty nipple right there. <laughs> Is that, is, no. that, is that a dirty nipple, everyone, or what? Can you increase the light? Or is that it? I don't think it'll just... Yeah, better? We're going to stick it in every hole we can until we find something good. We're not going to stick it in a gas tank. Um, I don't want to wreck it, like, the first 30 seconds I have it. How else am I going to look up my nose later? Right? Gotta think ahead sometimes. All right, so from here, we've eliminated a spark, compression. The fuel looks pretty decent. We're gonna take the carb off and clean it. Um, we noticed that the plunger on the accelerator pump looks like it's non-existent. Uh, the accelerator pump uh, sprays a little extra fuel on it as you first step on it um, because the vacuum is not quite there yet to pull in the fuel it needs to get that up and go, so it kind of falls on its face. I might have one at home from the Fleet Master. Um, the carbs are tricky because it depends whether somebody's drilled out the jets or not or, or messed with them before because they really weren't designed to run on today's fuel. But um, this thing looks like it's been on the road in the last 5-10 years so um, hopefully it just needs a cleaning. We'll take it in the Varsol tank. Uh, hopefully we don't wreck any gaskets and hopefully I have a, an accelerator pump plunger left over from the Fleetmaster build. Another issue that I see is um, this, there's a flap inside here with a big weight. There's supposed to be a coil spring on it that attaches probably to this lever. And when it's cold, it blocks off the exhaust and it warms up the carburetor or something like that. And when it's hot, it opens it up. But either way, it's supposed to be functioning and it's not. So I, I spent days messing around with Fleetmaster trying to get it to run right. So as long as everything is there and working the way it should, we've got to eliminate those things, right? Who knows, maybe it'll work. Rich and I came out here checking out this old gent's car collection. He says, you know, go walk the property, go into the barns and everything. Went to the first barn, found a couple of old Hudsons, which were really beautiful and cool. Walked around the outer yard. There's a lot of stuff sitting here. And we thought, ah, that's gotta be it for the end of the day. Until we pulled open the barn, that'll look at the big shop. So this little lady here is very interesting because in 1909, Rolls-Royce only had the emblem on the hood and it was becoming customary that you would have a special statue on the hood to, to make your car dignified and what have you. So uh, they put on here the spirit of ecstasy in tribute to a secret love affair between a couple of the employees at Rolls-Royce. So I think this is a 40s to 50s Rolls-Royce uh, Silver Wraith. And the reason why I think that is not just the body style and the way it looks, but from Spirit of Ecstasy, that she is on her knees kneeling forward. So 1909 to 1950s, she was on her knees. Uh, they also called her the Spirit of Speed for the longest time. Uh, but 1950 and beyond, uh, she was standing up, leaning back. So it's just a change in the, the styling of the statue that they did over time. It was status to be able to have one of these, and th there's no question, they are absolutely beautiful cars. I mean, the back seat has like uh, trays and everything for sitting down, relaxing. Every six inches, there's like an ashtray for you. <laughs> so it's, it's just style and class, you know? You, you can't get much better than that. Just to stumble on this so close to our hometown is, is pretty incredible and crazy. It has a lock on the hood. We, Keep people like me out. We get <laughs> So this is 1948 uh, Packard 90 series and they're, they're beautiful cars and everything but what makes this one famous is that in 1955 a young Marty McFly took his mom to the Enchanted Under the Sea dance where things got really awkward. This is a 1956 Packard Caribbean and what's interesting about this one is they only made about 250 of the uh, the coupes, but had it been a convertible top, it would have been like 81,000 American and up, depending on the condition. So it is a really cool car, and the, the best way to be able to spot them is the, uh, the twin hood scoops on there, but they are just 
beautiful cars. This is a 1953 Hudson Hornet, also made famous by the uh, Disney Pixar's Cars movie, uh, played by Paul Newman as Doc Hudson. These cars were essentially the start of racing, dirt racing, what have you. Uh, this car was really innovative because prior to this, all vehicles basically had a flat floor. And what Hudson went ahead and did is they channeled the, uh, the floors to go around the frame to make the body sit lower. That is the first time in history you'll ever see a car have the channel through the floors for the, the drive shaft and everything. And it was the first time you didn't step up into a car, you stepped down into a car. And that's what made it just so revolutionary at the time because nobody did that. Nobody had a, a channeled floor or a molded floor around the, the frame and everything to get the car as low and stable as possible so it was able to do the racing that it did. It was very cool. And as you can see, this sits lower than any other car made back in its day and it made it a huge competitor in the dirt racing as well as the paved racing, but there weren't many tracks back in those days. But th there's a reason why they chose it for the Cars movie. These do have a, a long-standing history in racing. That is so cool. Let's buy this one. Look at the monstrous hood on this thing. It's 34 That's to 37 Chrysler uh, Airflow. Uh, this was Chrysler's first attempt at aerodynamics because everything up to this point was really boxy, what have you. That's pretty cool. It, it looks like a Volkswagen bug. Look it at looks, this safety bumper. Like how much. It looks, looks like a Citroen. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, it, does. it looks like yeah, it was yeah. European design. And look at the brad on this thing. That's like as big as a toddler. <laughs> like a big tree. Can you uh, see oh, look at this thing? That is the weirdest. Look so, so that's why the bumper is so huge. Oh, the, the big U, yeah. <laughs> because the hood goes through. Yeah. What we have so, here is a 1951 Chrysler Imperial uh, convertible. What makes it interesting is there are only 651 of these ever made. But what it makes it especially special is one of threes were donated to the Royal Monarchy for Princess Elizabeth's tour of Canada in 1951. So she has sat in the back of this car and we have dug up some stock footage of that. There were like lights like around in here. Yeah. Somebody said they did a lot of work to it, but look, like this whole windshield, the top half of the windshield has been done. There's, there's a seam right across and there's a patch right here. Now the pictures of the convertible in Niagara Falls had two spotlights like the, the cops used to have. And that's that patch right here. Is there a patch on that side? Yeah, I bet there is. yeah. yeah it is. So putting a price on a car like this with the history, impossible. It could be could be completely priceless. Trillions of dollars. Trillions. 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 Like we could wipe out Canada's debt with this car. Yeah. You know, the queen sat in this car. What we're hoping to is this one's got a Hemi under the hood. You think there's a latch? Oh, there is a latch. So it's either an inline eight or a V8. Bit a man. Hopefully oh, the hinges heavy. aren't seized. Yeah, well, on that side. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's a hemi. <laughs> that thing's huge. Yeah, that's yeah. a hemi. It's body number 154. Of six made in Detroit, Michigan. That's insane. He said it's had a lot of work done, but it needs a lot more. I think it's like all Bondo in the trunk here. It's got power top, I think. Yeah. Needs to go to a museum. Whatever, nobody crawls under the car except for you. Look at this, look at all this stuff moving. It's like a, it's like a clock. Somebody spent a long time laying awake at night bothering his wife going, oh, if I make it do this, and then the lever hits that, and then if that lever flips up, then I'll flip the choke up, and then the choke will be electronic, and then I need it to move these two levers, and then hit the accelerator pump. I'm not exactly sure how everything works, but it's clean. While Rich was taking apart the carburetor, me and Aaron then got lunch, which was way more important. But while he was taking it apart, we discovered one of the potential problems. So this carb, there's gasket was in there. It shrank over time or it was the wrong gasket. We can see how it was letting air in all the sides. See how much soot and black there was. So we're just going to uh, remake it. I'm going to use some cardboard. Rich is finding more parts for us to try and use. It's close. Yeah. That one's not good. Yeah, no. Okay, I think we're stuck I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make one, it'll be easy. Okay. You could do this with like a ball peen hammer and tap the edge, but this is the underside or one side of the uh, carburetor and it makes a really nice template already so I don't have to really fidget around and try and make it very specific. And uh, one of these. There we go. So 
that'll give us our outline. We'll cut that out. Work of art. Yeah, I can clean that up. So, uh, this is your needle and seat. So this is where your fuel comes in. This is a tiny needle that bottoms out on a taper at the bottom. Um, and as the fuel comes in, it's allowed to go in until the float raises up. It pushes up against this little knob and shuts the fuel from entering. As soon as the fuel drops down, it opens it up again. This is made out of brass, but I can hear a little bit of fluid on the inside. It means that there's a leak. So that will start interfering when you're under load. All right, so the carburetor, this magic little thing that's been around for 100 years. This is not gonna be a how-to rebuild carb video. Just because we don't have a carb kit, we're just trying to get this by as is with what we've got. Three main parts, your throat where your air filter sits on, where the air enters and usually houses the choke. Your venturi that has a drop in pressure to pull fuel in from the fuel bowl underneath with uh, various jets to allow a metered amount of fuel to enter the engine. Basically what we're doing is taking it apart, cleaning it, blowing everything out, making sure there's no deposits and putting it back together. Put the last two screws back in it again and see what happens. There we go. Done. So this is some of the motor treatment. You can dump it right in the fuel or right into the crank, it says, if you want to clean the internal. So we're going to drop some into this gross fuel and see if it does a change. I don't know. We'll find out. Super concentrated. You can, I can see it swirling actually around. You guys can't see it, but I can definitely see it's, it's reacting a bit with the fuel. Is it making any noise? Let me listen. I hear the ocean. It definitely changed the smell of the gasoline. It's not as putrid smelling. Like before it smelled like really off gas and now it smells cleaner. Here, smell it. <laughs> so we drain the entire tank, eliminate the possibility that there's something wrong with the fuel. We put new fuel in it. Uh, we got high octane. The problem with these old cars is they used to, they depended on using lead as an additive and we still needed to put a lead replacement in the fuel with it. But we're also throwing the STP 5-in-1 in. in. Uh, mainly, the main thing I really like about it is the pre it prevents the ethanol deposits. With the high ethanol concentration that we have nowadays, if you don't run it every day, it really starts to build up the carb and get deposits and stuff in that. On top of that, it, it uh, inhibits the corrosion, which is good for this uh, engine as well. Um, and it saves on gas, reduces friction, all that good stuff. It's good for about uh, 130 liters, good for gas and for diesels. They have uh, two different kinds out there. We're only going to throw half of this in because we're only throwing in 20 liters there. Ah, it's nice and clear now. That's good. I'm happy with that. Yeah. I just run away better. It's idling! Nice! It's, it's kind of like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That's running way better. Like a hundred times better. Yeah. The test is the gauge doesn't even have a needle in it. That's just it getting hot enough to actually burn off all the crud. Right. I think we take it for a little boot rooney I think it'll just drive better and better. Yeah. There's no blue. And it's getting better. It needs a certain amount of resistance for some reason. I was messing around with my Fleet Master and all of a sudden it ran different. Like it ran way better with the air cleaner on, but I think that air cleaner needs a good cleaning. So maybe we'll do that next, make sure that it's got enough air. You can't take it right off because then the vacuum's not right or something. I'm, I don't know, but anyway, we'll try that. It's, it's starting to sound better. So maybe we get to take it down the road. Some of these had an oil bath where you just put oil in the bottom. Um, this being a, 39 it might be or it might just be like a 
uh, turbulence effect and I think it is just the turbulence effect. No no way to get in there. If that's even the original. If it's the original, yeah. I I don't know. That looks I think that looks old. <laughs> <laughs> old but it's clear, so I don't know. I've seen the the masses and that had a really nice pre cleaner on it. Mm. And then um like it worked really, really well. Good enough that they stopped making them because they weren't selling air filters anymore. Um but uh, and same with the oil bath, it works great. Does it? But um yeah, I don't know. So it could be that this thing is closed or seized. Maybe not the exhaust is hot. It might go. Does that turn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Squeaky, 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 squeaky. We should just try it both ways. I know, and just leave the vice grips on. You're not doing that? So it's running better, a lot better. Yeah. Things that are definitely wrong, we've got a little seepage on the head gasket. Even though it's not overheating, and this valve is seized on the exhaust here, we've got a broken exhaust bolt. But um, the owner lives right across the road, so what do you think? So we're gonna Let's go visit him, man. Let's, let's go visit, let's go for a ride. I think we'll throw the hood back on again. Okay, so when we got here this morning, it wasn't running. It would kind of run, but barely under its own power. We got it idling now, and it's moving under its own power. It doesn't have the power that it's supposed to, and I think we have a little seepage on the head gasket, but all the smoke is gone coming out the back. It used to be a big white cloud this morning. Yeah. The STP, I'm sure it hasn't uh, done all its magic yet because we haven't ran it long enough. We're gonna go just across the road. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not gonna stall. I think it needs a head gasket regardless. It's just starting to seep and that might bring the compression up a little bit yet. So we'll see if he can get us a head gasket if he wants to keep, uh, keep it running. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't check the scope to see the carbon inside, but it's running 10 times better. It's running way better and we can at least take it for a drive. Yeah. So that's a success in my books. <laughs> not every day you get to drive a 39 Hudson. So anyway, here we go. Yeah. That's moving way better. Are you just your foot pegged? It's almost pegged, yeah. But still, it's a 1937. Right. Seatbelt on? Yeah. Wait, we're not gonna die? Is it gonna make it up? Is it gonna make it up? Is it gonna make it up? <laughs> this is downhill. <laughs> Doesn't that knock like that? I think that's exhaust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Kind of make it up the hill. Listen to the pop the hood. I hear the rad. Yeah. Oh. He's boiling like crazy. Yeah. Uh, so it's head gasket for sure. It's stealing coolant out of this overflow up here. Oh, well that sucks. So it's definitely head gasket. Oh, we did make it up the hill. 
We might have to get Stefan to bump it one more time. Nope. We're gonna make it! We're gonna make it! Yeah, okay, it was. <laughs> it sounds so good. You just need to get really hot and it fixed itself. May yeah, maybe like that's how you fix a head gasket, right? You heat them up and then you quench them. Yeah. So it's like you just heat them up naturally, and then you just wait for all the coolant to boil over and do its thing and shrink, and it fixes itself. That's 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 how we roll at the bus garage. Things just you just keep driving them, and then eventually things just fix themselves, one one way or another. So. Um, I'm not a lab technician or anything, but uh, it looks like it mixed really well in there uh, without us shaking it. Still smells like gas, smells not great, but uh, with the additives in there and the amount that we put in, I feel confident that our prized possession little car here can, uh, can take this. Enjoy, my friend. Enjoy. All right, so since we can't stick our scope in there to see if that uh, anything's being done to the engine, I grabbed a couple intake valve or exhaust valves. These are miled out. These have about 300,000 kilometers on it. If I scratch it, it should be that shiny. Instead, it's black. And if I scratch it, I can't really take any of that carbon off. Put a couple in uh, some containers. I'm just gonna put a concentrated solution of the five-in-one cleaner. Now this is for fuel. Uh, but I want to see if it, it claims that, that it cleans the injectors. Just wondering if it does anything to the carbon on an exhaust valve. If it does, um, I'm going to be pretty impressed. So we did that. And we also have this motor treatment, which says that it cleans the fuel injectors, um, cleans the intake valves, and even though these are exhaust valves, these are extreme conditions. Child safety, holding the camera. Oh, look at the talent. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, it's thicker than that stuff is. We'll see if it does anything. We'll let that sit for about a week and then we'll take a look at it. Here we go. So I'm missing my lab coat and my, my fancy glasses and I need a clipboard. But aside from all that, we've got these two exhaust valves. This is a concentrated solution. It's been sitting in here for a week and I can see that just the wipes is leaving a mark in the carbon. Whereas before I couldn't scratch it off with my fingernail. And now I... If you can see that, it's scraping the carbon off. So it is definitely doing something. If I look at the solution, I can see little black sitting at the bottom. So definitely it's broken down the carbon. Now this is the five in one. It's a concentrated solution, so and it has no heat on it. So in your engine, there'd be heat, and this solution would be mixed with your fuel. This is meant for the fuel or oil. And wipe that off. And looking at it, you can see the black that's coming off. It's not digging in as much as the five in one, actually. And you take your nail. I don't think it's leaving as much of an impression as the five in one. And if you look at this solution, it's much cleaner. There is a little bit of carbon in there. You can see some black stuff floating around. So what do we know? I know that we fixed our carburetor, replaced the fuel in our 39 Hudson, put some additives in it, and it has no more white smoke and has no more blue smoke. Now, the additives didn't do all of that all at once. It takes a long time for this stuff to work, and we haven't had the time to fully check that. Unfortunately, I think we were looking into a pre-combustion chamber with our scope, so we weren't able to um, actually see the top of the pistons and how much carbon was on there. I do know that that car runs a lot better. I also know that after a week of these valves sitting in a concentrated solution, that the carbon has been breaking down and it's in the bottom of our cans. So if you guys have used STP, let us know what you think and the results that you've had with them. As for me, I see them as being only beneficial. I'm gonna throw them in some of my vehicles. We'll get back to them and see what they're like in a few months. But aside from that, it's time to get back to our other projects. Thank you very much to STP for sending us these products and um, thank you for watching. So here we go. First off, how do you get this thing open? So what you do is you grab every hood ornament and you yank on it and maybe it opens, right? I did that once. I was doing a mission test on trucks like all week <laughs> and the Max, you pull on the dog, right? The yeah. big trucks that pull on the Mac dog, pull it up. A guy came with his prized Western star 
and I think it's a giant horse. <laughs> and, and he's got a giant fleet of vehicles, and I walk right up to it, grab the horse, and snap it in half. Like, not even break it off the hood, snap the horse in half. We never got it back. I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs>